Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, it's a nice day. Decided to go ahead and start these lectures outside here. We had a little bit of rain earlier, but it looks like it's gone. So the first thing I want to talk to you about um, is lake measurements. This is the first of four small presentations on just basic limnology. This is the boiled down limnology, the things that we need to know to be able to do um, fish stuff, for lack of a better term. And so, you know, these subjects all go a lot deeper, but I'm just kind of giving you the things that we're going to need to know so that we can talk about other things later on in the class. So the first thing is just basic lake measurements or physical measurements. And I'm specifically talking about lake zones and then lake morphometry. Let me talk about these in each a little bit of detail. So this is a lot of vocabulary here. Now, limnology is the study of lakes, uh, study of fresh water, sometimes it's said. And we look at the physical, the chemical, and the biological parameters of these lakes. And we try to understand them. This is important if you're working with fish because you've got to understand the habitat the fish live in. So, first terms I want to throw at you just, just for vocabulary is lentic versus lodic. All right. Uh, lentic is standing water. Lodic is moving water. When you hear lodic, think locomotion. That's how you can tell the difference between the two. Now, there are some terms that are used interchangeably, but we do have kind of somewhat specific definitions for them. So whenever we talk about a standing body of water, a lot of time we'll talk, we'll call it a lake. This lake, that lake, Kentucky Lake, Barkley Lake. But really a lake is a natural body of water, not human made. Most of the bodies of water that we work on are human made, okay? And we call those reservoirs, ponds, impoundments. Usually a pond is a smaller impoundment and a reservoir is a bigger one. What's the cutoff? There's no standard way of doing it. Some states define a, a pond as less than 10 acres. Um, it's one of those things where I know it when I see it. You know, there's lots of very small ponds that are smaller than 10 acres and then there's kind of a gap and then you get larger reservoirs. It doesn't really matter. Um, we just try to, to have an idea of what we're talking about here. Now, um, most of these, all of those human-made reservoirs are made by damming up a stream. Okay, So converting a lotic water body into a lentic water body. Um, and we do have some other terminology here. If you dam it and the surface area does not double then we just call that a pool. So we say it's just a, a pool. Uh, sometimes we call that an impoundment, but usually we call that a pool. So on the Mississippi River, we have lots of pools because the dams do not increase the surface area more than double. But if the surface area doubles or more, we call that a reservoir. That's just a general term. Okay, so when we're talking about any lake reservoir, there are different zones within the lake and we want a way to describe those. So this is kind of a vocabulary thing. There are several ways we can describe the areas in a lake. And these overlap. Um, and so one area of the lake might have several definitions depending upon what you're talking about. And we define those zones based upon their general location, their vertical position, uh, temperature, and photosynthesis. So let me go over each of those, okay? In general, we call the shoreline the littoral zone. The open water is called the pelagic zone. And then the bottom is called the profundal zone. And so if you look at a general schematic, a side view of the lake here, you see the littoral zone is the shoreline. It's shallower area. It's often where you find vegetation growing. Profundal is sort of the bottom that's not in the littoral zone, that's underneath the pelagic zone, but it's the bottom, the sediments, and then the pelagic zone is the open water. Uh, another way that we can describe a lake or break a lake into zones is by vertical position. This is very simple, just the benthic area versus the water column. And so the entire bottom area where the sediments are, we call that the benthic area. The organisms that live there are called the benthos. And then the water 
that's above that, all the rest is just called the water column. That's another common way to describe the lake. A way that you hear a lot, uh, a, a way that we describe the lakes in a lot of way, a lot of times, is in reference to the water temperature. So some lakes stratify, and you have different strata based on temperature. And the upper layer that's warm is called the epilimnion. The bottom layer, which is cooler, is called the hypolimnion. And then there's usually a kind of a narrow transition zone between the two that's called the metalimnion, or the middle limnion. Some people also call this metalimnion the thermocline. And in common usage, that's fine. Technically, the thermocline is the plane. It's two-dimensional, and it's where you get the most rapid temperature change. But we, we tend to use thermocline and metalimnion interchangeably. So again, if you look at your side view of your lake, the upper layer is the epilimnion, then the metalimnion, and then the hypolimnion. Finally, we can look at um, photosynthesis and, and use photosynthesis in the lake to define different zones. Well, now, why would we do this? Why is photosynthesis so important to lakes? Well, photosynthesis is important to any ecosystem, right? It's where the, the energy gets captured that's available for all the organisms in that, eco, in that community. Um, so photosynthesis is always important. So we really, you know, that's a, that's a good enough reason to worry about it. But there's another reason that we worry about photosynthesis so much in lakes. And that is because this is where most of our oxygen comes from. And most of the organisms in our lake are going to require oxygen. And although there's lots of oxygen out here in the atmosphere, it doesn't dissolve well and it doesn't diffuse well into a lake. And so if the lakes just relied upon atmospheric oxygen, there would not be enough. You got to have phytoplankton doing photosynthesis, creating oxygen in order to have a functioning aquatic food web. So that's why we worry about it. It's the base of the food web and this is where we get our oxygen from. So in the upper layer, where there is photosynthesis, we call that the euphotic zone. Sometimes people just call it the photic zone. It's also called the trophogenic phone. Break down that word. Troph means food. Genic or genesis means create. This is where food is created. And of course, this is the upper part of the lake because that's where the sunlight is. And down deep, there's not enough sunlight. And so you don't have photosynthesis taking place, and that's called the tropholytic zone. Again, food is troph, and lytic or lysis is breakdown. And so there's not food being produced, but of course everything that gets produced in the top of a lake eventually rains down on the bottom, and we call that organic rain. And so all the waste products and the dead organisms eventually end up in the benthos or the profundal zone, which is also the tropholytic zone. Okay, so here is a picture of the lake, and I'm going to point out some different areas, and I want you to guess and tell me how you can describe those areas. Again, there's more than one way to describe certain areas of the lake. So this area right here could be described as what? Well, you could call that uh, the water column, you could call that the pelagic zone, and you could call that, also call that the epilimnion. All right? Uh, this area here, what could we call that? That's down at the bottom, that's the sediments, so we can call that the benthic zone. We can also call that the profundal zone. It's uh, the bottom, but it's not near the shoreline. Um, this area right here. Yes, of course, that's the shoreline, and that's shallow. That's called the littoral zone. Um, also, 
you don't really talk about the water column in the shallow areas like this. So I don't know if I'd call it the water column. And also, you know, it's usually shallow, so you don't notice stratification, but most of the time the littoral zone is captured in the epilimnion. Uh, you usually don't see stratification in the littoral zone. So these are just different ways that we can describe the lake. Okay. Um, now let's talk about just different measurements we can take on a lake. If we want to compare one lake to another, we just want to take some basic measurements. Also, we can use these measurements to sort of scale our results so we get so many fish per surface area, surface acre, things like that. So I want to talk about depth, shoreline development, and fetch. There are many other measurements we can take, but these are ones that are used the most often in fisheries. Well, depth is pretty easy. In limnology, depth is usually uh, uh, symbolized by the letter Z. So if you see Z, it's talking about depth. Uh, we're usually mostly concerned with the mean depth, the maximum depth, and the secchi depth. The secchi depth uh, is a measure of water clarity. We'll probably talk about that a little bit later. But there's a thing called a secchi disk. And here's what one looks like. and you lower the secchi disk until you can't tell the difference between the black and the white and that tells you the secchi depth and of course the clearer the water the deeper the secchi depth goes uh, often we represent our uh, depths in what's known as a bathymetric map and this looks like uh, other maps that you may have seen, but when these lines, when, when it's on a terrestrial system and the lines represent hills where they go up, we call that a topographic map. Here, this is a lake where it's going down and we call that a bathymetric map. And each of these lines is called an isobath. Iso means same, bath meaning depth, same depth. And so you you can tell that when the lines are closer together, you get a steeper slope. And, and most of you have probably seen um, maps like this. Now from a map like this we can calculate the average depth. One way to calculate the average depth which is Z with a bar over it, so mean depth, is to take the volume of the lake and divide it by the surface area. And if you look at the units this works, right? Volume would be in something like cubic meters. Surface area could be in square meters. And if you divide cubic meters by square meters, you're left with just meters, which would be the mean depth. And so the volume you could get from the bathymetric map, uh, surface area, same thing, you could get from the bathymetric map, you could get from any map, surface area. And so that's one way to calculate mean depth because it's uh, a way to get some simple measurements and get an estimate of mean depth. A better way is to use GIS. And this is something that we'll try and do in class. If you take my GIS class, you do it, where uh, we can use the computer and take lots of depth measurements and make a very accurate and precise three-dimensional uh, representation of the uh, lake. And then from that, you can get mean depth and things. Okay. Next thing we want to look at is called shoreline development. Now, you're probably familiar with shoreline length, we talk about that all the time. They claim that Kentucky Lake has a longer shoreline than Florida. i got to measure that before I believe it. Um, but shoreline length is not always informative. Okay, So if we look at two lakes, and let's pretend that these two lakes have the same surface area. Which one would you rather fish? You'd probably rather fish the one on the right, wouldn't you? Because it's it's more convoluted, it's got more coves, it's got more littoral zone, and that's where you're going to find more of your fish. Um, and so if we just measure the shoreline length, that doesn't necessarily tell us about the shape of the lake. And, uh, you know, if you look at these two lakes, they have the same area, but the one on the right has a much longer shoreline length. But again, if you just had that length, you wouldn't know anything about the shape of the lake. But shoreline development helps with that. And here is the formula. And what this is, is this is a ratio of the shoreline length to 
the circumference of a circle with the same area. So basically this is saying if this, if this lake was a perfect circle, it would have the area 2 times the square root of pi a, which is the bottom part, okay? And the value L here is the actual shoreline length. So how close is the shoreline length to the shoreline length of a perfect circle of the same area? Look at it and it'll make sense to you, okay? So if you think about that, if the lake is a perfect circle, what is the value of d sub L? Well, if your lake is a perfect circle, say it's like a prairie pothole, then it is a perfect circle. The shoreline length is the same as the perimeter of a circle of the same area because it is a circle. And so it'd be uh, the same value on top, same value on bottom. D sub L would equal 1. But now let's say you've got the lake of the same area, but it's got lots of coves. So the shoreline length has to get shorter or longer. And we're maintaining the same surface area. The shoreline length, of course, has to get longer. If, the shore, if you've got a perfect circle and the shoreline length gets smaller, the area has to decrease. There's no way. But if you take that perfect circle and you start making coves and, and inlets, the shoreline length has to get longer. And so this value L on top of this equation has to get bigger relative to the value on the bottom. So D sub L goes up. So if the lake is a perfect circle, d sub l is 1, but the more coves in that, the more convoluted the shoreline, d sub l gets bigger. So back to our original um, lakes here, the, they have the same surface area, but the one on the left has much less shoreline length relative, compared to the one on the right. And so the d sub l is much greater in the one on the right. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is a concept called fetch. And fetch is the distance that wind can blow over open water. Well, why would we be concerned with this? Well, the longer that wind can blow uninterrupted over water, the more of that wind energy that goes into that lake and the bigger the waves. And so if you have a very short fetch, the wind does not touch the water very much, there's not much energy can get in there and the waves don't get big. But if you think about Kentucky Lake or one of these larger lakes, and if the wind is blowing in the right direction, the wind can blow unimpeded for kilometers. And the longer that wind can stay touching the surface of that lake, the more that wind energy goes into the lake and the bigger the waves get. Now here's an example of something that we call effective fetch. This is a, a lake called Spring Lake, and these dots are on the shoreline of Spring Lake. It's not a very big lake. It's a reservoir, actually. You know, again, they call it a lake, but it's a reservoir. And these dots are spaced about 25 meters or so from each other on the shoreline, and the bigger the dot, the higher the effective fetch. This means that at each spot on the shoreline, we can estimate how much the wind is going to affect that spot. And this is based upon the fetch, which is how far the wind can blow across open water, and the prevailing winds, how often the wind blows in that direction. And so if you look at, say, one of these little dots in the back of a cove, they're very small. It's very small fetch. Well, that makes sense, because look, the wind can only touch the water for a very short distance, no matter which direction the wind is blowing from. And so these points of the shoreline have very small effective fetch, and they don't get um, hit by waves very much. But if you look at some of these other spots, for example here, you can see very large circles. And you'll note that there's a long stretch of open water next to these circles. And so if the wind can touch the water for a much larger area, 
And if the wind blows along the east-west axis very much, that means that this is going to be a very windy spot on the shoreline. And so we can define this for any place on the lake. We can say how much the fetch is, what the value of the fetch is relative to other spots on the lake. Now there's a simpler definition of fetch that is sometimes used, and that's just the longest length parallel to the prevailing winds. And so this does not look at each point on the lake and how relatively windy it is. This just says what are the prevailing winds in an area and what's the long longest direction of open water in parallel to those prevailing winds. And that tells you how relative how relatively windy this lake is to another lake. So if you're comparing two different lakes, you want to use the second definition. Okay, so that's a start here. This is physical lake measurements. I'll come back in a little bit with some more limnology. See ya.